This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to find out how to volunteer, please contact LibriVox.org. Bhagavad Gita Translated by Sir Edwin Arnold Introductory Note During the centuries in which Buddhism was establishing itself in the east of India, the older Brahmanism in the west was undergoing the changes which resulted in the Hinduism, which is now the prevailing religion of India. The main ancient sources of information with regard to these Hindu beliefs and practices are the two great epics, the Ramayana and the Mahabharata. The former is a highly artificial production based on legend and ascribed to one man, Valmike. The latter, a huge conglomeration of stirring adventure, legend, myth, history, and superstition, is a composite production begun probably as early as the 4th or 5th century before Christ, and completed by the end of the 6th century of our era. It represents many strata of religious belief. The Bhagavad Gita, of which a translation is here given, occurs as an episode in the Mahabharata, and is regarded as one of the gems of Hindu literature. The poem is a dialogue between Prince Arjuna, the brother of King Yudhisthira, and Vishnu, the supreme god, incarnated as Krishna, and wearing the disguise of a charioteer. The conversation takes place in a war chariot, stationed between the armies of the Kauravas and Andavas, who are about to engage in battle. To the Western reader, much of the discussion seems childish and illogical, but these elements are mingled with passages of undeniable sublimity. Many of the more puzzling inconsistencies are due to interpolations by later rewriters. It is, says Hopkins, a medley of beliefs as to the relation of spirit and matter, and other secondary matters. It is uncertain in its tone in regard to the comparative efficacy of action and inaction, and in regard to the practical man's means of salvation, but it is at one with itself in its fundamental thesis, that all things are each a part of one Lord, that men and gods are but manifestations of the one divine spirit. End of introductory note. This recording is in the public domain. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to find out how to volunteer, please contact LibriVox.org. The Bhagavad Gita. Translated by Sir Edwin Arnold. Chapter 1. Arjuna Vishad. Dhritarashtra, ranged thus for battle on the sacred plain on Karukshetra, say Sanjaya, say, what wrought my people and the Pandavas? Sanjaya, when he beheld the host of Pandavas, Raja Duryodhana to Drona drew and spake these words, Ah, Guru, see this line. How vast it is of Pandu fighting men, embattled by the son of Drupada, thy scholar in the war. Therein stands ranked chiefs like Arjuna, like to Bhima chiefs, benders of bows, Virata, Yuyudang, Drupada, eminent upon his car, Drishtaket, Chekitan, Kasi's stout lord, Purujit, Kunti Poj, and Shaivya, with Yudhamanyu and Uttamauj, Supatra's child, and Draupadis, all famed, all mounted on their shining chariots. On our side too, thou, best of Brahmins, see excellent chiefs, commanders of my line, whose names I joy to count, thyself the first. Then Bhishma, Karna, Kripa, fierce in fight, Vikarna, Ashwataman, next to those, strong, Saumadati, with full many more, 
valiant and tried, ready this day to die. For me their king, each with his weapon grasped, each skillful in the field, weakest, me seems. Our battle shows where Bihishma holds command, and Bhima, fronting him, something too strong. Have care, our captains nigh to Bhishma's ranks. Prepare what help they may. Now blow my shell. Then, at the signal of the aged king, with Blair to wake the blood, rolling round like to a lion's roar, the trumpeter blew the great conch, and at the noise of it, trumpets and drums, cymbals and gongs and horns burst into sudden clamor as the blasts of loosened tempests such the tumult seemed. Then might be seen, upon their car of gold, yoked with white steeds, blowing their battle shells. Krishna, the god, Arjuna at his side. Krishna, with knotted locks, blew his great conch, carved of the giant's bone. Arjuna blew Indra's loud gift. Bhima the terrible, Wolf-bellied Bhima blew a long reed conch, Yudhishthira. Kunti's blameless son winded a mighty shell, victory's voice. And Nakula blew shrill upon his conch, named the sweet-sounding. Sahadev, on his, called gem bedecked. And Kasi's prince, on his, Sikandi, on his car, Drishtanyong. Virata Sotaki, the unsubdued, Drupada, with his sons, O Lord of Earth. Long armed, Supadra's children all blew loud, so that the clangor shook their foemen's hearts with quaking earth and thundering heaven. Then twas, beholding Dhritarashtra's battle set, weapons unsheathing, bows drawn forth. The war instant to break. Arjuna, whose ensign badge was Hanuman the monkey, spake this thing to Krishna the divine, his charioteer. Drive, dauntless one, to yonder open ground betwixt the armies. I would see more nigh those who will fight with us, those we must slay. Today, in war's arbitrament, for sure. On bloodshed all are bent who throng this plain, obeying Dharitarastra's sinful son. Thus, Parajuna prayed, O Bharata, between the hosts that heavenly charioteer drove the bright car, reining its milk-white steeds, where Bhishma led, and Drona and their lords. See, spake he to Arjuna, where they stand, thy kindred of the Purus, And the prince marked on each hand the kinsmen of his house, grandsires and sires, uncles and brothers and sons, cousins and son-in-law, and nephews, mixed with friends and honored elders, some this side, some that side ranged. And seeing those opposed, such kith grown enemies, Arjuna's heart melted with pity, while he uttered this, Krishna, as I behold, come here to shed their common blood, yon concourse of our kin. My members fail, my tongue dries in my mouth, a shudder thrills my body, and my hair bristles with horror. From my weak hand slips, Gandiv, the goodly bow. A fever burns my skin to parching, hardly may I stand. The life within me seems to swim and faint. Nothing do I foresee save woe and wail. It is not good, O Keshav. Naught of good can spring from mutual slaughter. Lo, I hate triumph and domination, wealth and ease, thus sadly won. Aho! What victory can bring delight, Govinda? What rich spoils could profit? What rule recompense? What span of life itself seems sweet, bought with such blood? Seeing that these stand here, ready to die, for whose sake life was fair, and pleasure pleased, 
and power grew precious, grandsires, sires, and sons, brothers and fathers-in-law, and sons-in-law, elders and friends, shall I deal death on these, even though they seek to slay us? Not one blow, O Madhusudana, will I strike to gain the rule of all three worlds? Then how much less to seize an earthly kingdom? Killing these must breed but anguish, Krishna. If they be guilty, we shall grow guilty by their deaths. Their sins will light on us, if we shall slay those sons of Dharitarastra and our kin. What peace could come of that, O Madhava? For if indeed, blinded by lust and wrath, these cannot see or will not see, the sin of kingly lines o'erthrown, and kinsmen slain, how should not we, who see, shun such a crime? We who perceive the guilt and feel the shame, oh, thou delight of men, Janardana, by overthrow of houses perisheth their sweet continuous household piety, and, rights neglected, piety extinct, enters impiety upon that home. Its women grow unwomaned, whence there spring mad passions, and the mingling up of castes, sending a hellward road that family, and whoso wrought its doom by wicked wrath. Nay, and the souls of honored ancestors fall from their place of peace, being bereft of funeral cakes and the wan death water. So teach our holy hymns. Thus if we slay kinsfolk and friends for love of earthly power, Aovya, what evil fault it were. Better I deem it, if my kinsmen strike, to face them weaponless, and bare my breast to shaft and spear, than answer blow with blow. So speaking, in the face of those two hosts, Arjuna sank upon his chariot seat, and let fall bow and arrows, sick at heart. Here endeth chapter one of the Bhagavad Gita, entitled Arjuna Vishad, or The Book of the Distress of Arjuna. This recording is in the public domain. Chapter 2 of the Bhagavad Gita. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Peter Eastman. The Bhagavad Gita. Translated by Sir Edwin Arnold. Chapter 2. Sanjaya. Him, filled with such compassion and such grief, with eyes tear-dimmed, despondent, in stern words the driver, Madhusudan, thus addressed. Krishna, how hath this weakness taken thee? Whence springs the inglorious trouble, shameful to the brave, barring the path of virtue? Nay, Arjun, forbid thyself to feebleness. It mars thy warrior name. Cast off the coward fit. Wake, be thyself. Arise, scourge of thy foes. Arjuna. How can I, in the battle, shoot with shafts on Bhishma or on Drona? O thou chief, both worshipful, both honorable men. Better to live on baker's bread with those we love alive than taste their blood in rich feasts spread and guiltily survive. Ah, were it worse, who knows, to be victor or vanquished here, when those confront us angrily, whose death leaves living drear. In pity lost, by doubtings tossed, my thoughts distracted turn to thee, the guide I reverence most, that I may counsel learn. I know not what would heal the grief burned into soul and sense, if I were earth's unchallenged chief, a god, and these gone thence. Sanjaya So spake Arjuna to the lord of hearts, and sighing, 
I will not fight, held silence then. To whom, with tender smile, O Bharata, while the prince wept despairing twixt those hosts, Krishna made answer in divinest verse. Krishna, thou grievest where no grief should be, thou speakest words lacking wisdom. For the wise in heart mourn not for those that live, nor those that die. Nor I, nor thou, nor any one of these ever was not, nor ever will not be, for ever and for ever afterwards. All that doth live, lives always. To man's frame, as there come infancy and youth and age, so come there raisings up and layings down, of other and of other life abodes, which the wise know and fear not. This that irks, thy sense-life thrilling to the elements, bringing thee heat and cold sorrows and joys, tis brief and mutable. Bear with it, prince, as the wise bear. The soul which is not moved, the soul that with a strong and constant calm takes sorrow and takes joy indifferently, lives in the life undying. That which is can never cease to be. That which is not will not exist. To see the truth of both is theirs who part essence from accident, substance from shadow. Indestructible learn thou the life is, spreading life through all. It cannot anywhere, by any means, be anywise diminished, stayed, or changed. But for these fleeting frames which it informs, with spirit deathless, endless, infinite, they perish. Let them perish, prince, and fight. He who shall say, Lo, I have slain a man. He who shall think, Lo, I am slain. Those both know not. Life cannot slay. Life is not slain. Never the spirit was born. The spirit shall cease to be never. Never was time it was not. End and beginning are dreams. Birthless and deathless and changeless remaineth the spirit forever. Death hath not touched it at all, dead though the house of it seems. Who knoweth it exhaustless, self-sustained, immortal, indestructible? Shall such say, I have killed a man, or caused to kill? Nay, but as when one layeth his worn-out robes away, and taking new ones saith, These will I wear to-day, so putteth by the spirit lightly its garb of flesh, and passeth to inherit a residence afresh. I say to thee, weapons reach not the life, flame burns it not, Waters cannot o'erwhelm, nor dry winds wither it. Impenetrable, unentered, unassailed, unharmed, untouched, immortal, all arriving, stable, sure, invisible, ineffable, by word and thought uncompassed, ever all itself. Thus is the soul declared. How wilt thou then, knowing it so, Grieve when thou shouldst not grieve. How, if thou hearest that the man new dead is, like the man new born, still living man, one same existent spirit, wilt thou weep? The end of birth is death. The end of death is birth. This is ordained. And mournest thou, chief of the stalwart arm, for what befalls, which could not otherwise befall? The birth of living things comes unperceived, the death comes unperceived, between them beings perceive. What is there sorrowful herein, dear prince, wonderful, wistful to contemplate, difficult, doubtful to speak upon, strange and great for tongue to relate, mystical hearing for every one? Nor wotteth man this, what a marvel it is, when seeing and saying and hearing are done. This life within all living things, my prince, hides beyond harm. 
Scorn thou to suffer, then, for that which cannot suffer. Do thy part. Be mindful of thy name, and tremble not. Not better can be tied a martial soul than lawful war. Happy the warrior to whom comes joy of battle, comes as now, glorious and fair, unsought, opening for him a gateway unto heaven. But if thou shunst this honorable field, a kshatriya, if knowing thy duty and thy task thou bidst duty and task go by, that shall be sin. And those to come shall speak the infamy from age to age. But infamy is worse for men of noble blood to bear than death. The chiefs upon their battle chariots will deem twas fear that drove thee from the fray. Of those who held thee mighty souled, the scorn thou must abide, while all thine enemies will scatter bitter speech of thee to mock the valour which thou hadst. What fate could fall more grievously than this? Either, being killed, thou wilt win Swarga's safety, or, alive and victor, thou wilt reign an earthly king. Therefore, arise, thou son of Kunti, brace thine arm for conflict, nerve thy heart to meet, as things alike to thee, pleasure or pain, profit or ruin, victory or defeat. So minded, gird thee to the fight, for so thou shalt not sin. Thus far I speak to thee as from the Sankhya, unspiritually. Hear now the deeper teaching of the yoga, which holding, understanding, thou shalt burst thy karma bond, the bondage of wrought deeds. Here shall no end be hindered, no hope marred, no loss be feared. Faith, yea, a little faith, shall save thee from the anguish of thy dread. Here, glory of the Kurus, shines one rule, one steadfast rule, while shifting souls have laws many and hard. Specious but wrongful deem the speech of those ill-taught ones who extol the letter of their Vedas, saying, this is all we have or need. Being weak at heart with wants, seekers of heaven, which comes, they say, as fruit of good deeds done, promising men much profit in new births for works of faith, in various rites abounding, following whereon large merit shall accrue towards wealth and power. Albeit, who wealth and power do most desire, least fixity of soul have such, least hold on heavenly meditation. Much these teach from Veds concerning the three qualities. But thou, be free of the three qualities, free of the pairs of opposites, and free from that sad righteousness which calculates. Self-ruled, Arjuna, simple, satisfied. Look, like as when a tank pours water forth to suit all needs, so do these Brahmins draw texts for all wants from tank of holy writ. But thou, want not, ask not, find full reward of doing right in right. Let right deeds be thy motive, not the fruit which comes from them. And live in action, labor, make thine acts thy piety, casting all self aside, contemning gain and merit, equable in good or evil. Equability is yoke, is piety. Yet the right act is less, far less, than the right thinking mind. Seek refuge in thy soul, have there thy heaven. Scorn them that follow virtue for her gifts. The mind of pure devotion, even here, casts equally aside good deeds and bad, passing above them. Unto pure devotion devote thyself. With perfect meditation comes perfect act, and the right-hearted rise, 
more certainly because they seek no gain. Forth from the bands of body, step by step, to highest seats of bliss. When thy firm soul hath shaken off those tangled oracles which ignorantly guide, then shall it soar to high neglect of what's denied or said this way or that in doctrinal writ. Troubled no longer by the priestly lore, safe shall it live and sure, steadfastly bent on meditation. This is yoga and peace. Arjuna, what is his mark who hath that steadfast heart confirmed in holy meditation? How know we his speech, Kasava? Sits he, moves he like other men? Krishna, when one, O Pritha's son, abandoning desires would shake the mind, finds in his soul full comfort for his soul, he hath attained the yoke. That man is such in sorrows not rejected, and in joys not overjoyed, dwelling outside the stress of passion, fear, and anger, fixed in calms of lofty contemplation. Such a one is Muni, is the sage, the true recluse. He who to none and nowhere overbound by ties of flesh, takes evil things and good, neither desponding nor exulting, such bears wisdom's plainest mark. He who shall draw, as the wise tortoise draws its four feet safe under its shield, his five frail senses back under the spirit's buckler from the world which else assails them. Such a one, my prince, hath wisdom's mark. Things that solicit sense hold off from the self-governed. Nay, it comes the appetites of him who lives beyond depart, aroused no more. Yet may it chance, O son of Kunti, that a governed mind shall sometime feel the sense storm sweep, and rest strong self-control by the roots. Let him regain his kingdom, let him conquer this, and sit on me intent. That man alone is wise who keeps the mastery of himself. If one ponders on objects of the sense, there springs attraction. From attraction grows desire. Desire flames to fierce passion, passion breeds recklessness. Then the memory, all betrayed, lets noble purpose go and saps the mind, till purpose, mind, and man are all undone. But if one deals with objects of the sense, not loving and not hating, making them serve his free soul, which rests serenely, Lord, lo, such a man comes to tranquility. And out of that tranquility shall rise the end and healing of his earthly pains, since the will governed sets the soul at peace. The soul of the ungoverned is not his, nor hath he knowledge of himself which lacked, how grows serenity? And wanting that, whence shall he hope for happiness? The mind that gives itself to follow shows of sense, seeth its helm of wisdom rent away, and like a ship in waves of whirlwind, drives to wreck and death. Only with him, great prince, whose sense are not swayed by things of sense, only with him who holds his mastery shows wisdom perfect. What is midnight gloom to unenlightened souls shines wakeful day, is known for night, thick night of ignorance to his true seeing eyes. Such is the saint. And like the ocean, day by day receiving floods from all lands, which never overflows, its boundary line not leaping and not leaving, fed by the rivers but unswelled by those. So is the perfect one. To his soul's ocean, the world of sense pours streams of witchery. They leave him as they find, without commotion, taking their tribute, but remaining sea. Yea, 
whoso, shaking off the yoke of flesh, lives lord, not servant, of his lusts, set free from pride, from passion, from the sin of self, toucheth tranquillity. O Pritha's son, that is the state of Brahm. There rests no dread when that last step is reached. Live where he will, die when he may, such passeth from all plaining to blessed nirvana, with the gods attaining. End of chapter 2ஜனார்தன If meditation be a nobler thing than action, wherefore then, great Keshava, dost thou impel me to this dreadful fight? Now am I by thy doubtful speech disturbed. Tell me one thing, and tell me certainly, by what road shall I find the better end? Krishna, I told thee, blameless Lord, there be two paths shown to this world, two schools of wisdom. First, the Shankis, which doth save in way of works, prescribed by reason. Next, the yoga which bids attained by meditation spiritually yet these are one no man shall escape from act by shunning action nay and none shall come by mere renouncements unto perfectness nay and no jot of time at any time rests any actionless his nature's law compels him even unwilling into act for thought is act in fancy He who sits suppressing all the instruments of flesh yet in his idle heart thinking on them plays the inept and guilty hypocrite but he who with strong body serving mind gives up its mortal powers to worthy work not seeking gain arjuna such an one is honorable do thine allotted task work is more excellent than idleness the body's life proceeds not lacking work there is a task of holiness to do unlike world binding toil which bindeth not the faithful soul such earthly duty do free from desire and thou shall well perform thy heavenly purpose spake prajapati in the beginning when all men were made and with mankind the sacrifice do this work sacrifice increase and multiply with sacrifice This shall be Kamaduk, your cow of plenty, giving back her milk of all abundance. Worship the gods thereby. The gods shall yield a grace. Those meats ye crave, the gods will grant to labor, when it pays tithes in the altar flame. But if one eat fruits of the earth, rendering to kindly heaven no gift of toil, that thief steals from his world. Who eat of food after their sacrifice are quit of fault, but they... that spread a feast all for themselves eat sing and drink of sin by food the living live food comes of rain and rain comes by the pious sacrifice and sacrifice is paid with tithes of toil thus action is of brahma who is one the only all pervading at all times present in sacrifice he that abstains to help the rolling wheels of this great world glutting his idle sense lives a lost life shameful and vain existing for himself self concentrated serving self alone no part hath he in aught nothing achieved no road or unroad toucheth him no hope of help for all the living things of earth depends from him therefore thy task prescribed with spirit unattached gladly perform since in performance of plain duty man mounts to his highest bliss by works alone janak and ancient saints reached blessedness 
Moreover, for the upholding of thy kind, action thou shouldst embrace. What the wise choose, the unwise people take. What best men do, the multitude will follow. Look on me, thou son of Preeta. In the three wide worlds, I am not bound to any toil. No height awaits to scale. No gift remains to gain. Yet I act here, and if I acted not, earnest and watchful, those that look to me for guidance, sinking back to sloth again, because I slumbered, would decline from good. And I should break Earth's order and commit her offspring son to ruin Bharata. Even as the unknowing toil wedded to sense, so let the enlightened toil sense freed, but set to bring the world deliverance and its bliss. Not sowing in those simple, busy hearts seeds of despair. Yea, let each play his part in all he finds to do with unyoked soul. All things are everywhere by nature wrought in interaction of the qualities. The fool, cheated by self, thinks this I did and that I wrote. But ah, those strong-armed prince, a better lesson mind, knowing the play of visible things within the world of sense and how the qualities must qualify, stand at the loof even from his acts. The untaught lip mixed with them. knowing not nature's way of highest aims unwitting slow and dull those make thou not to stumble having the light but all thy dues discharging for my sake with meditation centered inwardly seeking no profit satisfied serene heedless of issue fight they who shall keep my ordinance thus the wise and willing hearts have quitance from all issue of their acts but those who disregard my ordinance thinking they know know not and fall to loss confused and foolish sooth the instructed one does of his kind following what fits him most and lower creatures of their kind in vain contending against the law needs must it be the objects of the sense will stir the sense to like and dislike yet the enlightened man yields not to these knowing them enemies finally this is better that one do his own task as he may even though he fail than take tasks not his own though they seem good to die performing duty is no ill but who seeks other roads shall wander still arjuna Yet tell me teacher by what force doth man go to his ill unwilling as if one pushed him that evil path Krishna karma it is passion it is born of the darknesses which pusheth him mighty of appetite sinful and strong this is man's enemy as smoke bloats the white fire as clinging rust mars the bright mirror as the boom surrounds the babe unborn so is the world of things foiled soiled enclosed in the desire of flesh the wise fall caught in it the unresting foe it is of wisdom wearing countless forms fair but deceitful subtle as a flame sense mind and reason these o kunti san are booty for it in its play with these it maddens man beguiling blinding him therefore thou noblest child of parata govern thy heart constrain the entangled sense resist the false soft sinfulness which saps knowledge and judgment yea the world is strong but what discerns it stronger and the mind strongest and high over all the ruling soul wherefore perceiving him who reigns supreme put forth full force of soul in thy own soul fight vanquish foes and doubts dear hero slay what haunts thee in fond shapes and would betray here endeth chapter 3 of the bhagavad gita entitled karma yoga or the book of virtue in work recording by priya for librivox Chapter 4 of Bhagavad Gita This is a LibriVox recording 
All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Shweta Marda. Bhagavad Gita, translated by Sir Edwin Arnold, Chapter 4. Krishna, this deathless yoga, this deep union, I taught Viswatha, the Lord of Light. Viswatha to Manu gave it, he to Ishvaku. He so passed it down the line of all my royal rishis. Then with years the truth grew dim and perished, noble prince. Now once again to thee it is declared, this ancient lore, this mystery supreme, seeing I find thee votary and friend. Thy birth, dear Lord, was in these later days, and bright Viswatha's preceded time. How shall I comprehend this thing thou sayest? From the beginning it was I who taught? Manyfold the renewals of my birth have been Arjun, and of thy births too. But mine I know, and thine thou knowest not. O slayer of thy foes, albeit I be unborn, undying, indestructible, the lord of all things living, not the less by Maya, by my magic which I stamp on floating nature forms. The primal vast I come and go and come. When righteousness declines, O Bharat, when wickedness is strong, I rise from age to age and take visible shape and move man with men, succoring the good, thrusting the evil back and setting virtue on her seat again. Who knows the truth touching my birds on earth and my divine work when he quits the flesh, puts on its load no more, falls no more down to earthly birth. To me he comes, dear Prince. Many there be who come from fear set free, from anger, from desire, keeping their hearts fixed upon me, my faithful, purified by sacred flame of knowledge such as these mix with my being. Whoso worship me, them I exalt, but all men everywhere shall fall into my path. Abet those souls which seek reward for works, make sacrifice now to the lower gods. I say to thee here, have they their reward, but I am he, made the four castes, and portion them a place after their qualities and gifts. Ye, I created the reposeful. I that live immortally made all those mortal births. For works soil not my essence, being works wrought uninvolved. Who knows me acting thus unchained by action? Action binds not him, and so perceiving all those saints of old worked, seeking for deliverance. Work thou as in the days gone by thy fathers did. Thou sayest perplexed. It had been asked before by singers and by sages, What is act and what is inaction? I will teach thee this. And now, knowing thou shalt learn which work doth save, needs must one rightly meditate those three. Doing, not doing, and undoing. Here thorny and dark the path is. He who sees how action may be rest, rest action. He is wisest mid his kind. He hath the truth. He doth well, acting or resting. Freed in all his works from prickings of desire, burned clean in act by the white fire of truth. The wise call that, wi that man wise, and such a one, renouncing fruit of deeds, always content, always self-satisfying, if he works, doth nothing that shall stain his separate soul, which quit of fear and hope, subduing self, rejecting outward impulse, yielding up to body, bodies need nothing save body, dwells sinless amid all sin, with equal calm, taking what may befall, by grief unmoved, unmoved by joy, unenviably the same in good and evil fortunes, no wise bound by bond of deeds, nay, but of such a one whose crave is gone, 
whose soul is liberate, whose heart is set on truth, and of such a one whose work he does is work of sacrifice, which passeth purely into ash and smoke, consumed upon altar. All's then God, the sacrifice is Brahma, the key and grain are Brahma, the fire is Brahma, and the flesh it eats is Brahma, and on to Brahma attain he who in such office meditates on Brahma. Some votaries there be who serve the gods with flesh and altar smoke, but others some who lighting subtler fires make purer rite with will of worship, of the which be they who in white flame of continence consume joys of the sense, delights of ear and eye, foregoing tender speech and sound of song, and they who kindling fires with torch of truth burn on a hidden altar stone the bliss of youth and love, renouncing happiness, and they who lay for offering their, their wealth, their penance, meditation, piety, their steadfast reading of the scrolls, their lore, painfully gained with long austerities, and they who making silent sacrifice draw in their breath to feed the flame of thought, and breathe it forth to waft the heart on high, governing the vintage of each entering air, lest one sigh pass which hath helped not the soul. And they who day by day, denying needs, lay life itself upon the altar flame, burning the body van. Lo, all these keep the rite of offering, as if they slew victims, and all thereby efface much sin, Ye, and who feed on the immortal food left of such sacrifice, to Brahma pass to the unending. But for him that makes no sacrifice, he hath nor part nor lot even in the present world. How should he share another, O thou glory of thy line? In sight of Brahma all these offerings are spread and are accepted. Comprehend that all proceed by act, for knowing this, thou shalt be quit of doubt. The sacrifice which knowledge pays is better than great sacrifice or great gifts offered by wealth, since gifts worth, O my prince, lies in the mind which gives, the will that serves, and these are gained by reverence, by strong search, by humble heed of those who see the truth and teach it. Knowing truth, thy heart no more will ache with error, for the truth shall show all things subdued to thee, and thou to me. Moreover, son of Pandu, wert thou worst of all wrongdoers, this fair ship of truth should bear thee safe and dry across the sea of thy transgressions. As the kindled flame of feeds on the fuel, till it sinks to ash, so on to ash, Arjuna, on to naught, the flame of knowledge wastes, works, draws away. There is no purer like thereto in all this world, and he who seeketh it shall find it, being grown perfect in himself, believing he receives it when the soul masters itself, and cleaves to truth and comes, possessing knowledge, to the higher peace, the utmost repose. But those untaught and those without full faith, and those who fear are shent. No peace is here or otherwhere, no hope nor happiness for whoso doubts. He that being self-contained hath vanquished doubt, disparting self from service, soul from works, enlightened and emancipate, my prince. Works fetter him no more. Cut then a twin with sword of wisdom, son of Bharat, this doubt that binds thy heartbeats, cleave the bond born of thy ignorance. Be bold and wise. Give thyself to the field with me. Arise. End of chapter 4. Bhagavad Gita. Translated by Sir Edwin Arnold. Translated by Sir Edwin Arnold. Chapter 5 of the Bhagavad Gita. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Carl Manchester, 2008. The Bhagavad Gita, 
Chapter 5 The Book of Religion by Renouncing Fruit of Works Arjuna Yet Krishna, at the one time thou dost laud surcease of works, and at another time service through work. Of these twain plainly tell which is the better way. Krishna To cease from works is well, and to do works in holiness is well, and both conduct to bliss supreme. But of these twain the better way is his, who working piously refraineth not. That is the true renouncer, firm and fixed, who, seeking naught, rejecteth naught, dwells proof against the opposites, that is, joy and sorrow, success and failure, heat and cold, etc. O valiant prince, in doing such breaks lightly from all deed. Tis the new scholar talks as they were two, this Sankhya and this Yoga. Wise men know who husbands one plucks golden fruit of both. The region of high rest which Sankhyans reach, Yogins attain. Who sees these twain as one sees with clear eyes. Yet such abstraction, chief, is hard to win without much holiness. Who is fixed in holiness, self-ruled, pure-hearted, Lord of senses and of self, lost in the common life of all which lives, a yogayukt. He is a saint who wends straightway to Brahm. Such an one is not touched by taint of deeds. Nought of myself I do, thus will he think, who holds the truth of truths, in seeing, hearing, touching, smelling, when he eats or goes or breathes, slumbers or talks, holds fast or loosens, opens his eyes or shuts, always assured this is the sense world, plays with senses. He that acts in thought of Brahm, detaching end from act, with act content, the world of sense can no more stain his soul than waters mar the enamelled lotus leaf. With life, with heart, with mind, nay, with the help of all five senses, letting selfhood go, yogins toil ever towards their soul's release. Such votaries, renouncing fruit of deeds, gain endless peace. The unvowed, the passion-bound, seeking a fruit from works, a fastened down. The embodied sage, withdrawn within his soul, at every act sits godlike in the town which hath nine gateways, i.e. the body, neither doing aught nor causing any deed. This world's lord makes neither the work nor passion for the work, nor lust for fruit of work. The man's own self pushes to these. The master of this world takes on himself the good or evil deeds of no man, dwelling beyond. Mankind errs here by folly, darkening knowledge. But for whom that darkness of the soul is chased by light, splendid and clear shines manifest the truth, as if a sun of wisdom sprang to shed its beams of dawn. Him meditating still, him seeking, with him blended, stayed on him, the souls illuminated, Take that road which hath no turning back, Their sins flung off by strength of faith. Who will may have this light, Who hath it sees. To him who wisely sees, The Brahman with his scrolls and sanctities, The cow, the elephant, the unclean dog, The outcast, gorging dog's meat, Are all one. The world is overcome, I even here, by such as fix their faith on unity. The sinless Brahma dwells in unity, and they in Brahma. Be not over glad, attaining joy, and be not over sad, encountering grief. But stayed on Brahma, still constant, let each abide. The sage, whose soul holds off from outer contacts, in himself finds bliss. To Brahma joined by piety, 
His spirit tastes eternal peace. The joys springing from sense life are but quickening wounds which breed sure griefs. Those joys begin and end. The wise mind takes no pleasure, Kunti's son, in such as those. But if a man shall learn, even while he lives and bears his body's chain, to master lust and anger, he is blessed. He is the Yukta. He hath happiness, contentment, light within. His life is merged in Brahma's life. He doth Nirvana touch. Thus go the Rishis unto rest, who dwell with sins effaced, with doubts at end, with heart governed and calm. Glad in all good they live, nigh to the peace of God, and all those live who pass their days exempt from greed and wrath, subduing self and senses, knowing the soul. The saint who shuts outside his placid soul all touch of sense, letting no contact through, whose quiet eyes gaze straight from fixed brows, whose outward breath and inward breath are drawn equal and slow through nostrils still and close, that one with organs, heart and mind constrained, bent on deliverance, having put away passion and fear and rage, hath even now obtained deliverance ever and ever freed. Yea, for he knows me who am he that heeds the sacrifice and worship, God revealed, and he who heeds not, being Lord of worlds, lover of all that lives, God unrevealed, wherein who will shall find surety and shield. Here ends chapter 5 of the Bhagavad Gita, entitled Karma Sanyasayog, or The Book of Religion by Renouncing Fruit of Works. Chapter 6 of the Bhagavad Gita. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Leon Meyer. The Bhagavad Gita. Translated by Sir Edwin Arnold. Chapter 6 Krishna. Therefore, who doeth work rightful to do? Not seeking gain from work, that man, O Prince, is sannyasi and yogi, both in one. And he is neither who lights not the flame of sacrifice, nor setteth hand to task. Regard as true renouncer, him that makes worship by work, for who renounceth not, works not as yogin. So is that well said, by works the votary doth rise to saint, and saintship is the ceasing from all works. Because the perfect yogin acts, but acts unmoved by passions and unbound by deeds, setting result aside. Let each man raise the self by soul, not trample down his self, since soul that is self's friend may grow self's foe. Soul is self's friend when self doth rule over self, but self turns enemy if soul's own self hates self as not itself. The sovereign soul of him who lives self-governed and at peace is centered in itself, taking alike pleasure and pain, heat, cold, glory, and shame. He is the yogi, he is yukta, glad with joy of light and truth, dwelling apart upon a peak, with senses subjugate, whereto the clod, the rock, the glistering gold, show all as one. By this sign is he known, being of equal grace to comrades, friends, chance comers, strangers, lovers, enemies, aliens, and kinsmen, loving all alike, evil or good. Sequestered should he sit, steadfastly meditating, solitary, his thoughts controlled, his passions laid away, of belongings, in a fair, still spot, having his fixed abode, not too much raised, nor yet too low, let him abide, his goods a cloth, a deerskin, and the kusa grass. There, 
setting hard his mind upon the one, restraining heart and senses, silent, calm. Let him accomplish yoga, and achieve pureness of soul, holding immovable body and neck and head, his gaze absorbed upon his nose end, wrapped from all around, tranquil in spirit, free of fear, intent upon his brahmacharya vow, devout, musing on me, lost in the thought of me. That yogin, so devoted, so controlled, comes to the peace beyond, my peace, the peace of high nirvana. But for earthly needs, religion is not his who too much fasts, or too much feasts, nor his who sleeps away an idle mind, nor his who wears to waste his strength and vigils. Nay, Arjuna, call that the true piety which most removes earth aches and ills, where one is moderate in eating and in resting and in sport, measured in wish and act, sleeping betimes, waking betimes for duty. When the man so living centers on his soul, the thought, straightly restrained, untouched internally by stress of sense, then is he yukta. See, steadfast a lamp, burns sheltered from the wind. Such is the likeness of the yogi's mind, shut from sense storms and burning bright to heaven. When mind broods placid, soothed with holy want, when self contemplates self, and in itself hath comfort, when it knows the nameless joy beyond all scope of sense, revealed to soul, only to soul, and, knowing, wavers not, true to the farther truth. When, holding this, it deems no other treasure comparable, but, harbored there, cannot be stirred or shook by any gravest grief, call that state peace, that happy severance yoga, call that man the perfect yogin. Steadfastly the will must toil thereto, till efforts end in ease, and thought has passed from thinking, shaking off all longings bred by dreams of fame and gain, shutting the doorways of the senses, close with watchful ward. So, step by step, it comes to gift of peace assured and heart assuaged, when the mind dwells self-wrapped and the soul broods cumberless. But as often as the heart breaks, wild and wavering, from control, so often let him recurve it, let him rein it back to the soul's governance. For perfect bliss grows only in the bosom tranquilized, the spirit passionless, purged from offense, vowed to the infinite. He who thus vows his soul to the supreme soul, quitting sin, passes unhindered, to the endless bliss of unity with Brahma. He so vowed, so blended, sees the life soul resident in all things living, and all living things in that life soul contained. And whoso thus discerneth me in all, and all in me, I never let him go, nor looseneth he hold upon me, but dwell where he may, whate'er his life, in me he dwells and lives, because he knows and worships me, who dwell in all which lives, and cleaves to me in all. Arjuna, if a man sees everywhere, taught by his own similitude, one life, one essence in the evil and the good, hold him a yogi, yea, well perfected. Arjuna, slayer of Madhu, yet again this yoga, this peace, derived from equanimity, made known by thee. I see no fixity therein, no rest, because the heart of men is unfixed, Krishna, rash, tumultuous, willful, and strong. It were all one, I think, to hold the wayward wind as tame man's heart. Krishna, hero long-armed, beyond denial, hard man's heart is to restrain and wavering, Yet may it grow restrained by habit, prince, by want of self-command. This yogi, I say, cometh not lightly to the ungoverned ones, but he who will be master of himself shall win it, if he stoutly strive thereto. 
Arjuna. In what road goeth he who, having faith, fails Krishna in the striving? Falling back from holiness, missing the perfect rule, is he not lost, straying from Brahma's light, like the vain cloud which floats twixt earth and heaven, when lightning splits it and it vanisheth? Fain would I hear thee answer me herein, since, Krishna, none save thou can clear the doubt. Krishna, he is not lost, thou son of Prita, no, nor earth nor heaven is forfeit, even for him, because no heart that holds one right desire treadeth the road of loss. He who should fail, desiring righteousness, cometh at death unto the region of the just, dwells there measureless years, and, being born anew, beginneth life again in some fair home, amid the mild and happy. It may chance he doth descend into a yogin's house on virtue's breast, but that is rare. Such birth is hard to be obtained on this earth, chief. So hath he back again what heights of heart he did achieve, and so he strives anew to perfectness, with better hope, dear prince. For by the old desire he is drawn on unwittingly, and only to desire the purity of yoga is to pass beyond the Shabdabram, the spoken Ved. But being yogi, striving strong and long, purged from transgressions, perfected by births following on births, he plants his feet at last upon the farther path. Such an one ranks above ascetics, higher than the wise, beyond achievers of vast deeds. Be thou yogi, Arjuna, and of such believe, truest and best is he who worships me with inmost soul, stayed on my mystery. Here endeth chapter 6 of the Bhagavad Gita, entitled Atmasanyamayag, or The Book of Religion by Self-Restraint. The Bhagavad Gita, or Song Celestial, translated by Sir Edwin Arnold. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The present recording is by Raju. Ramina45 at Hotmail.com The Bhagavad Gita or Song Celestial Translated by Sir Edwin Arnold Chapter 7 Krishna Learn now, dear Prince, how if thy soul be set ever on me, still exercising you, still making me thy refuge, thou shalt come most surely into perfect hold of me. I will declare to thee that utmost law, whole and particular, which when thou knowest, leaveth no more to know here in this world. Of many thousand mortals, one perchance striveth for truth, and of those few that strive, nay, and rise high, one only here and there knoweth me, as I am the very truth. Earth, water, flame, air, ether, life, and mind, and individually those eight make up the showing of me manifest. And these be my lower nature, learn the higher, whereby, though valiant one, this universe is by its principle of life produced, whereby the worlds of visible things are bound, as from a yoni. No, I am that whom I make and I unmake this universe. Than me there is no other master. Prince, no other maker, all these hang on me, as hangs a row of pearls upon its string. I am the fresh taste of the water, I the silver of the moon, the gold of the sun, the word of worship in the Vedas, the thrill that passeth in the ether, and the strength of a man's shed seed. I am the good sweet smell of the moistened earth, I am the fire's red light, the vital air moving in all which moves, the holiness of hollowed souls, the root undying. Whence hath sprung water is, the wisdom of the wise, the intellect of the informed, the greatness of the great, the splendor of the splendid. Kunti's son, these am I, free from passion and desire. Yet am I right desire in all who yearn. Chief of the Bharatas, for all those moods, suit fast, or passionate, or ignorant, which nature frames, deduce from me. But all are merged in me, not I in them. The world deceived by those three qualities of being, 
wotteth not me, who am outside them all, above them all, eternal, hard it is to pierce that veil divine of various shows which hideth me. Yet they who worship me pierce it and pass beyond. I am not known to evil doers, nor to foolish ones, nor to the base and churlish, nor to those whose mind is cheated by the show of things, nor those that take the way of Asuras. Four sorts of mortals know me, he who weeps, Arjuna, and the man who yearns to know, and he who toils to help, and he who sits certain of me in light hand. Of these four, O Prince of India, highest, nearest, best, that last is the devout soul, wise, intent upon the one. Dear above all am I to him, and he is dearest unto me. All four are good, and seek me, but mine own, the true of heart, the faithful, stayed on me, taking me as their utmost blessedness. They are not mine, but I, even I myself, at end of many births to me, they come. Yet hard the wise Mahatma is to find, that man who saith, All is Vasudev. There be those two, whose knowledge, turned aside by this desire or that, gives them to serve, some lower gods with various rites constrained, by that which moulded them, unto all such worship what shrine they will, what shapes, in faith, is I who give them faith, I am content, the heart thus asking favour from its god, darkened but ardent, hath the end it craves, the lesser blessing, but it's I who give, yet soon is withered what small fruit they reap. Those men of little minds who worship so, go where they worship, passing with their gods. But mind come unto me, blind are the eyes, which deemeth unmanifested manifest, not comprehending me in my true self, imperishable, viewless, undeclared, hidden behind my magic veil of shows. I am not seen by all. I am not known, unborn and changeless to the idle world. But I, Arjuna, know all things which were, and all which are, and all which are to be, albeit not one among them knoweth me. By passion for the pairs of opposites, by those twain snares of like and dislike, Prince, all creatures live bewildered, save some few, who quit of sins, holy in act, in form, freed from the opposites, and fixed in faith, cleave unto me. Who cleave, who seek in me, refuse from birth and death, those have the truth, those know me, Brahma, know me, soul of souls, the Adhyatman, know Karma, my work, know I am Adi Buddha, Lord of life, and Adi Deva, Lord of all the gods, and Adi Yajna, Lord of sacrifice, worship me well with hearts of love and faith, and find and hold me in the hour of death. Here end of chapter 7 of the Bhagavad Gita, entitled Vinyana Yoga or the Book of Religion by Discernment. End of chapter 7 The Bhagavad Gita or Song Celestial, translated by Sir Edwin Arnold. Recording by Raju, Ramina45 at hotmail.com. Bhagavad Gita, translated by Sir Edwin Arnold, Chapter 8. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The present recording is by Raju, Ramina45 at Hotmail.com. The Bhagavad Gita, Chapter 8 of Religion by Devotion to the One Supreme God. Arjuna, who is that Brahma? What that soul of souls? The Adhyatma. What thou best of all? Thy work, the karma, tell me what it is. Thou namest Adi Buddha. What again means Adi Deva? A. Eh, and how it comes? Thou canst be Adi Yajna in thy flesh, slayer of Madhu. Further, make me know how good men find thee in the hour of death. Krishna, I, Brahma, am the one eternal God, and Adhyatman is my being's name. The soul of souls, what goeth from me, causing all life to live, is karma. 
called and manifested in divided forms i am the adi bhuta lord of lives and adi deva lord of all the gods because i am purusha who begets and adi yajna lord of sacrifice i speaking with thee in this body here am thou embodied one for all the shrines flame unto me and at the hour of death he that hath meditated me alone in putting off his flesh comes forth to me enters into my being doubt thou not but if he meditated otherwise at hour of death in putting off the flesh he goes to what he look for kunti's son because the soul is fashioned to its like have me then in thy heart always and fight thou too when heart and mind are fixed on me shall surely come to me all come who cleave with the never wavering will of firmest faith warning none other gods all come to me the uttermost purusha holiest who so hath known me lord of sage and singer ancient of days of all the three worlds stay boundless but unto every atom bringer of that which quickens it who so i say hath known my form which passeth mortal knowing seen my effulgence which no i hath seen than the sun's burning gold more brightly glowing dispersing darkness unto him hath been right life and in the hour when life is ending with mind set fast and trustful piety drawing still breath beneath calm brows unbending in happy peace that faithful one doth die in glad peace passeth to purusha's heaven the place which they who read the vedas name aksharam ultimate where to have striven saints and ascetics their road is the same that way the highest way goes he who shuts the gates of all his sense locks desire safe in his heart centers the vital airs upon his parting thought steadfastly set and murmuring om the sacred syllable emblem of brahm dies meditating me for who none other gods regarding looks ever to me easily am i gained by such a yogi and attaining me they fall not those mahatmas back to birth to life which is the place of pain which ends but take the way of utmost blessedness the worlds arjuna even brahma's world roll back again from death to life's unrest but they o kunti's son that reach to me taste birth no more if ye know brahma's day which is a thousand yugas if ye know the thousand yugas making brahma's night then know ye day and night as he doth know when that vast dawn doth break the invisible is brought anew into the visible when that deep night doth darken all which is fades back again to him who sent it forth ye this was company of living things again and yet again produced expires at brahma's nightfall and at brahma's dawn riseth without its will to life new born but higher deeper innermost abides another life not like the life of sense escaping sight unchanging this endures when all created things have passed away this is that life named the unmanifest the infinite the all the uttermost thither arriving none return that life is mine and i am there and prince by faith which wanders not there is a way to come thither i the purusha i who spread the universe around me in whom dwell all living things may so be reached and seen richer than holy fruit on vedas growing greater than gifts better than prayer or fast such wisdom is the yogi this way knowing comes to the utmost perfect peace at last here end of chapter 8 of the bhagavad gita entitled achara parabrahma yog or the book of religion by devotion to the one supreme god this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org the present recording is by raju ramina45 at hotmail.com Chapter 9 of the Bhagavad Gita. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. 
for more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Shubda Garani. The Bhagavad Gita, translated by Sir Edwin Arnold. Chapter 9 of Religion by the Kingly Knowledge and the Kingly Mystery. Krishna, now will I open unto thee whose heart rejects not that lost lore deepest concealed, that farthest secret of my heavens and earths, which but to know shall set thee free from ills, a royal lore, a kingly mystery, yea, for the soul such light as purgeth it from every sin, a light of holiness, with inmost splendor shining plain to see, easy to walk by, inexhaustible. They that receive not this, failing in faith to grasp the greater wisdom, reach not me, destroyer of thy foes. They sink anew into the realm of flesh, where all things change. By me the whole vast universe of things is spread abroad. By me the unmanifest. In me are all existences contained, not I in them. Yet they are not contained, those visible things. Receive and strive to embrace the mystery majestical. My being, creating all, sustaining all, still dwells outside of all. See as the shoreless airs move in the measureless space, but are not space, and space were space without the moving airs. So all things are in me, but are not I. At closing of each Kalpa, Indian Prince, all things which be back to my being come. At the beginning of each Kalpa, all issue newborn from me. By energy and help of Prakriti, my outer self, again and yet again, I make go forth the realms of visible things without their will, all of them by the power of Prakriti. Yet these great makings, Prince, involve me not, enchain me not. I sit apart from them, other and higher and free, no wise attached. Thus doth the stuff of worlds, molded by me, bring forth all that which is, moving or still, living or lifeless. Thus the worlds go on, the minds untaught mistake me, veiled in form, not see they of my secret presence, not of my hid nature, ruling all which lives, vain hopes pursuing, vain deeds doing, fed on vainest knowledge, senselessly they seek an evil way, the way of brutes and fiends. But my Mahatmas, those of noble soul who tread the path celestial, worship me with hearts unwandering, knowing me the source, the eternal source of life. Unendingly they glorify me, seek me, keep their vows of reverence and love, with changeless faith adoring me. Yea, and those too adore, who offering sacrifice of wakened hearts, have sense of one pervading spirit's stress, one force in every place, though manifold. I am the sacrifice, I am the prayer, I am the funeral cake set for the dead, I am the healing herb, I am the key, the mantra and the flame, and that which burns. I am, of all this boundless universe, the father, mother, ancestor, and guard, the end of learning, that which purifies in lustral water. I am Om. I am Rig Veda, Sama Veda, Yajur Veda, the way, the fosterer, the Lord, the judge, the witness, the abode, the refuge house, the friend, the fountain and the sea of life which sends and swallows up, treasure of worlds and treasure chamber, seed and seed sower, 
When endless harvests spring, sun's heat is mine, heaven's rain is mine to grant or to withhold. Death am I, and immortal life I am, Arjuna, sat and asat, visible life and life invisible. Yea, those who learn the threefold Vedas, who drink the Soma wine, purge sins, pay sacrifice. From me they earn passage to Swarga, where the meat's divine. Of great gods feed them in high Indra's heaven. Yet they, when that prodigious joy is o'er, paradise spent and wage for merits given, come to the world of death and change once more. They had their recompense, they stored their treasure, following the threefold scripture and its writ, who seeketh such gaineth the fleeting pleasure of joy which comes and goes, I grant them it. But to those blessed ones who worship me, turning not otherwhere, with minds set fast, I bring assurance of full bliss beyond. Nay, and of hearts which follow other gods in simple faith, their prayers arise to me, O Kunti's son, though they pray wrongfully. For I am the receiver and the Lord of every sacrifice, which these know not rightfully, so they fall to earth again. Who follow gods go to their gods, who while their souls to Pithris go to Pithris, minds to evil boots given o'er sink to the boots. And whoso loveth me, cometh to me. Whoso shall offer me in faith and love, a leaf, a flower, a fruit, water poured forth, that offering I accept, lovingly made with pious will. Whatever thou doest, Prince, eating or sacrificing, giving gifts, praying or fasting, let it all be done for me as mine. So shalt thou free thyself from karmabhat, the chain which holdeth men to good and evil issue. So shalt come safe unto me, when thou art quit of flesh, by faith and abdication joined to me. I am alike for all. I know not hate, I know not favor. What is made is mine. But them that worship me with love, I love. They are in me, and I in them. Nay, Prince, if one of evil life turn in his thought straightly to me, count him amidst the good. He hath the highway chosen. He shall grow righteous ere long. He shall attain that peace which changes not. Thou, Prince of India, be certain none can perish trusting me. O Pritha's son, whoso will turn to me, though they be born from the very womb of sin, woman or man, sprung of the Vaishya caste, or lowly disregarded Sudra, all plant foot upon the highest path. How then the holy Brahmans and my royal saints? Ah! Ye who into this ill world are come, fleeting and false, set your faith fast on me, fix heart and thought on me, adore me, bring offerings to me, make me prostrations, make me your supremest joy, and undivided unto my rest, your spirits shall be guided. Here ends chapter 9 of the Bhagavad Gita entitled Raja Vidya Raja Guha Yoga or The Book of Religion by the Kingly Knowledge and Kingly Mystery. Chapter 10 of the Bhagavad Gita This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Shubda Garani. The Bhagavad Gita, translated by Sir Edwin Arnold. Chapter 10 
of religion by the heavenly perfections. Krishna Hear farther yet thou long-armed Lord, these latest words I say, uttered to bring thee bliss and peace, who lovest me alway. Not the great company of gods nor kingly rishis know my nature, who have made the gods and rishis long ago. He only knoweth, only he is free from sin and wise, who seeth me, Lord of the worlds, with faith enlightened eyes, unborn, undying, unbegun. Whatever natures be to mortal men distributed, those natures spring from me. Intellect, skill, enlightenment, endurance, self-control, truthfulness, equability, and grief or joy of soul, and birth and death, and fearfulness, and fearlessness, and shame and honor, and sweet harmlessness, and peace which is the same, whatever befalls, and mirth and tears, and piety, and thrift, and wish to give, and will to help, all cometh of my gift. The seven chief saints, the elders four, the lordly Manus set, sharing my work to rule the worlds, these two did I beget, and Rishis, Pitris, Manus, all by one thought of my mind, thence did arise to fill this world, the races of mankind, wherefrom who comprehends my reign of mystic majesty, that truth of truths is thenceforth linked in faultless faith to me. Yea, knowing me, the source of all, by me all creatures wrought, the wise in spirit cleave to me, into my being brought. Hearts fixed on me, breaths breathed to me, praising me, each to each, so have they happiness and peace, with pious thought and speech. And unto these, thus serving well, thus loving ceaselessly, I give a mind of perfect mood, whereby they draw to me, and all for love of them, within their darkened souls I dwell, and with bright rays of wisdom's lamp, their ignorance dispel. Arjuna Yes, thou art Parabrahm, the high abode, the great purification. Thou art God eternal, all creating, holy, first, without beginning, Lord of lords and gods, declared by all the saints, by Narada, Vyasa, Asita, and Devalas, and hear thyself declaring unto me, What thou hast said now I know to be truth, O Keshava, that neither gods nor men nor demons comprehend thy mystery, made manifest, divinest. Thou thyself, thyself alone dost know, Maker Supreme, Master of all the living, Lord of gods, King of the universe. To thee alone belongs to tell the heavenly excellence of those perfections wherewith thou dost fill these worlds of thine, pervading, imminent. How shall I learn supremest mystery to know thee, though I muse continually? Under what form of thine unnumbered forms mayest thou be grasped? Ah, yet again recount, clear and complete, thy great appearances, the secrets of thy majesty and might. Thou high delight of men, never enough can mine ears drink the amrit of such words. Krishna, Hanta, so be it, Kuru Prince, I will to thee unfold some portions of my majesty, whose powers are manifold. I am the spirit seated deep in every creature's heart. From me they come, by me they live, at my word they depart. Vishnu of the Adityas I am, those lords of light, Marichis of the Maruts, the kings of storm and blight. By day I gleam the golden sun of burning cloudless noon. By night, amid the asterisms, I glide the dappled moon. Of Vedas I am Samaved, of gods in Indra's heaven, Vasava. 
of the faculties to living beings given, the mind which apprehends and thinks, of Rudras, Shankara, of Yakshas and of Rakshasas, Vitesh, and Pavaka of Vasus, and of mountain peaks, Meru, Rihaspati Nomi mid planetary powers, mid warriors heavenly, Skanda, of all the water floods, the sea which drinketh each, and Brigu of the holy saints, and Om of sacred speech, of prayers, the prayer ye whisper, of hills, Himalayas snow, and Ashwatha, the fig tree, of all the trees that grow, of the Devarishis, Narada, and Chitrarath of them that sing in heaven, and Kapila of Munis, and the gem of flying steeds, Uchaisravas, from Amrit wave which burst, of elephants, Airavatha, of males, the best and first, of weapons, heaven's hot thunderbolt, of cows white, Kamaduk, from whose great milky udder teats all hearts' desires are struck, Vasuki of the serpent tribes round Mandara entwined, and thousand fanged Ananta, on whose broad coils reclined leans Vishnu, and of water things Varuna, Aryam of Pitris, and of those that judge, Yama, the judge I am, of Daityas, dread Prahalada, of what meets day and ears, times self I am, of woodland beasts, buffaloes, deers, and bears, the lordly painted tiger, of birds, the vast Garud, the whirlwind, mid the winds, mid chiefs, Rama, with blood imbrued, Makar mid fishes of the sea, and Ganges mid the streams. Here, first and last, and center of all which is or seems, I am, Arjuna, wisdom supreme of what is wise, words on the uttering lips I am, and eyesight of the eyes, and A of written characters, Dvandva of knitted speech, and endless life, and boundless love, whose power sustaineth each, and bitter death which seizes all, and joyous sudden birth which brings to light all beings that are to be on earth, and of the viewless virtues, fame, fortune, song am I, in memory, in patience, in craft, in constancy, of Vedic hymns, the Brihatsam, of meters, Gayatri, of months, the Marga Sirsha, of all the seasons three, the flower wreathed spring. In Dicer's play, the conquering double eight, the splendor of the splendid, and the greatness of the great, victory I am, and action, and the goodness of the good, and Vasudev of Rishni's race, and of this Pandu's brood, thyself, ya yeah, my Arjuna, thyself, for thou art mine, of poets, Usana, of saints, Vyasa, sage divine, the policy of conquerors, the potency of kings, the great unbroken silence in learning's secret things, the lore of all the learned, the seed of all which springs, living or lifeless, still or stirred, whatever brings be. None of them is in all the worlds, but it exists by me. Nor tongue can tell, Arjuna, nor end of telling come, of these my boundless glories, whereof I teach thee some. For whosoever is wondrous work and majesty and might, from me hath all proceeded. Receive thou this aright. Yet how shouldst thou receive, O Prince, the vastness of this word? I, who am all and made it all, abide its separate Lord. Here ends chapter 10 of the Bhagavad Gita, entitled Vibhuti Yoga or the Book of Religion by the Heavenly Perfections. Chapter 11 of the Bhagavad Gita Translated by Sir Edwin Arnold This is a LibriVox recording. 
All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Shubda Garani. The Bhagavad Gita, translated by Sir Edwin Arnold. Chapter 11 of the Manifesting of the One and Manifold. Arjuna, this for my soul's peace have I heard from thee, the unfolding of the mystery supreme named Adhyatman, comprehending which my darkness is dispelled. For now I know, O lotus-eyed, whence is the birth of men and whence their death, and what the majesties of thine immortal rule. Fain would I see, as thou thyself declarest it, Sovereign Lord, the likeness of that glory of thy form wholly revealed. O thou divinest one, if this can be, if I may bear the sight, make thyself visible, Lord of all prayers. Show me thy very self, the eternal God. Krishna, gaze then, thou son of Pritha, I manifest for thee those hundred thousand thousand shapes that clothe my mystery. I show thee all my semblances, infinite, rich, divine, my changeful hues, my countless forms. See in this face of mine, Adityas, Vasus, Rudras, Ashwins, and Maruts. See wonders unnumbered Indian prince, revealed to none save thee. Behold, this is the universe. Look, what is life and dead? I gather all in one, in me. Gaze as thy lips have said, on God eternal, very God. See me, see what thou prayest. Thou canst not, nor with human eyes, Arjuna, ever mayest. Therefore I give thee sense divine. Have other eyes, new light, and look. This is my glory, unveiled to mortal sight. Sanjaya, then, O king, the god so saying, stood to Pritha's son, displaying all the splendor, wonder, dread of his vast almighty head. Out of countless eyes beholding, out of countless mouths commanding, countless mystic forms enfolding in one form, supremely standing, countless radiant glories bearing, countless heavenly weapons bearing, crowned with garlands of star clusters, robed in garb of woven lusters, breathing from his perfect presence, breaths of all delicious essence, of all sweetest odors, shedding blinding brilliance, overspreading, boundless, beautiful, all spaces, from his all-regarding faces. So he showed, if there should rise suddenly within the skies, sunburst of a thousand suns, flooding earth with rays undeemed of, then might be that Holy One's majesty and glory dreamed of. So did Pandu's son behold all this universe unfold, all its huge diversity into one great shape, and be visible and viewed and blended in one body, subtle, splendid, nameless, the all-comprehending God of gods, the never-ending deity. But sore, amazed, thrilled, overfilled, dazzled and dazed, Arjuna knelt and bowed his head and clasped his palms and cried and said, Arjuna, Yea, I have seen, I see, Lord, all is wrapped in thee. The gods are in thy glorious frame, the creatures of earth and heaven and hell. In thy divine form dwell and in thy countenance show all the features of Brahma sitting lone upon his lotus throne of saints and sages and the serpent races, Ananta Vasuki. Ya mightiest Lord, I see thy thousand thousand arms and breasts and faces, and eyes on every side, perfect, diversified, and nowhere end of thee, nowhere beginning, 
nowhere a center shifts wherever soul's gaze lifts thy central self all willing and all winning infinite king i see the anadem on thee the club the shell the discus see thee burning in beams insufferable lighting earth heaven and hell with brilliance blinding glorious flashing turning darkness to dazzling day look i whichever way ah lord i worship thee the undivided the uttermost of thought the treasure palace wrought to hold the wealth of the world the shield provided to shelter virtue's laws the fount whence life's stream draws all waters of all rivers of all being the one unborn unending unchanging and unblending with might and majesty past thought past seeing silver of moon and gold of sun our glances rolled from thy great eyes thy visage beaming tender over the stars and skies doth to warm life surprise thy universe the worlds are filled with wonder of thy perfections space star sprinkled and the place from pole to pole of the heavens from bound to bound hath thee in every spot thee thee where thou art not a holy marvelous form is nowhere found o mystic awful one at sight of thee made known the three worlds quake the lower gods draw nigh thee they fold their palms and bow body and breast and brow and whispering worship loud and magnify thee rishis and siddhas cry hail highest majesty from sage and singer breaks the hymn of glory in holy melody sounding the praise of thee while countless companies take up the story rudras who ride the storms the adityas shining forms vasus and sadhyas vishvas ushmapas Maruts and those great twins, the heavenly fair Ashwins, Gandharvas, Rakshasas, Siddhas, Asuras. These see thee and revere in silence-stricken fear. Yea, the worlds, seeing thee with forms stupendous, with faces manifold, with eyes which all behold, unnumbered eyes, vast arms, members tremendous. flanks lit with sun and star feet planted near and far touches of terror melts wrathful and tender the three wide worlds before thee adore as i adore thee quake as i quake to witness so much splendor i mark thee strike the skies with front and wondrous wise huge rainbow painted glittering and thy mouth opened and orbs which i see all things whatever be in all thy worlds east west and north and south o eyes of god o head my strength of soul is fled gone is heart's force rebuked is mind's desire when i behold thee so with awful brows a glow with burning glance and lips lighted with fire fierce as those flames which shall consume at close of all earth heaven ah me i see no earth and heaven thee lord of lords i see thee only only thee ah let thy mercy unto me be given thou refuge of the world lo to the cavern hurled of thy wide opened throat and lips white touched i see our noblest ones great dhritarashtra's sons bhishma drona and karna caught and crushed the kings and chiefs drawn in that gaping gorge within the best of all both armies torn and riven between thy jaws they lie mangled fell bloodily ground into dust and death like streams down driven with helpless haste which go in headlong furious flow 
straight to the gulfing maw of the unfilled ocean. So to that flaming cave these heroes great and brave pour in unending streams with helpless motion. Like moths which in the night flutter towards a light, drawn to their fiery doom, flying and dying, so to their deaths still throng, blind, dazzled, borne along, ceaselessly all these multitudes wild flying. Thou that hast fashioned men, devourest them again, one with another, great and small alike, the creatures whom thou makest, with flaming jaws thou takest, lapping them up, Lord God, thy terrors strike from end to end of earth, filling life full from birth to death with deadly burning lurid dread. Ah, Vishnu, make me know why is thy visage so? Who art thou feasting thus upon thy dead? Who, awful deity, I bow myself to thee, Namastute Devavara Prasiddha. O mightiest Lord, rehearse, why hast thou face so fierce? Whence did this aspect horrible proceed? Krishna, thou seest me as time who kills, time who brings all to doom, the slayer time, ancient of days, come hither to consume, accepting thee. Of all these hosts of hostile chiefs arrayed, there shines not one shall leave alive the battlefield, dismayed, no longer be. Arise, obtain renown, destroy thy foes, fight for the kingdom waiting thee, when thou hast vanquished those. By me they fall, not thee. The stroke of death is dealt them now, even as they stand thus gallantly. My instrument art thou. Strike, strong-armed prince, at Drona, at Bhishma, strike. Deal death to Karna, Jayadratha, stay all this warlike breath. It's I who bid them perish, thou wilt but slay the slain. Fight, they must fall, and thou must live, victor upon this plain. Sanjaya Hearing mighty Keshav's word, tremblingly, that helmed Lord clasped his lifted palms and praying the grace of Krishna, stood there saying, with bowed brow and accents broken, these words timorously spoken. Arjuna, worthily Lord of might, the whole world hath delight in thy surpassing power, obeying thee the Rakshasas in dread at sight of thee are sped to all four quarters and the company of Siddhas sound thy name how should they not proclaim thy majesty's divinest mightiest thou Brahm then Brahma greater thou infinite creator thou God of gods life's dwelling place and rest Thou of all souls the soul, the comprehending whole, of being formed and formless being the framer, O utmost one, O Lord, older than eld who stored the worlds with wealth of life, O treasure claimed, who wottest all and art wisdom thyself, O part in all and all for all from thee have risen, Numberless now I see the aspects are of thee. Vayu thou art, and he who keeps the prison of Narak, Yama dark and Agni's shining spark. Varuna's waves are thy waves, moon and starlight are thine, Prajapati art thou. And it's to thee men kneel in worshipping the old world's far light. The first of mortal men, again thou God, again a thousand thousand times be magnified. Honor and worship be, glory and praise to thee. Namo namaste cried on every side. Cried here, above, below, uttered when thou dost go, uttered when thou dost come. 
namo we call namo stu god adored namo stu nameless lord hail to thee praise to thee thou one in all for thou art all yeah thou ah if in anger now thou shouldst remember i did think thee friend speaking with easy speech as men use each to each did call thee krishna prince nor comprehend thy hidden majesty the might the awe of thee did in my heedlessness or in my love on journey or in jest or when we lay at rest sitting at council straying in the grove alone or in the throng do thee most holy wrong be thy grace granted for that witless sin for thou art now i know father of all below of all above of all the worlds within guru of gurus more to reverence and adore than all which is adorable and high how in the wide worlds three should any equal be shall any other share thy majesty therefore with body bent and reverent intent i praise and serve and seek thee asking grace as father to a son as friend to friend as one who loveth to his lover turn thy face in gentleness on me good is it i did see this unknown marvel of thy form but fear mingles with joy retake dear lord for pity's sake thine earthly shape which earthly eyes may bear be merciful and show the visage that i know let me regard thee as of your arrayed with disk and forehead gem with mace and anadem thou who sustainest all things undismayed Let me once more behold the form I loved of old thou of the thousand arms and countless eyes my frightened heart is fain to see restored again the charioteer my krishna's kind disguise krishna yeah thou hast seen arjuna because i loved thee well the secret countenance of me revealed by mystic spell shining and wonderful and vast majestic manifold which none save thou in all the years had favor to behold for not by vedas cometh this nor sacrifice nor alms nor works well done nor penance long nor prayers nor chanted palms that mortal eyes should bear to view the immortal soul unclad prince of the kurus this was kept for thee alone be glad let no more trouble shake thy heart because thine eyes have seen my terror with my glory as i before have been so will i be again for thee with lightened heart behold once more i am thy krishna the form thou knewest of old sanjay these words to arjuna spake vasudev and straight did take back again the semblance dear of the well loved charioteer peace and joy it did restore when the prince beheld once more mighty brahma's form and face clothed in krishna's gentle grace arjuna now that i see come back janardana this friendly human frame my mind can think calm thoughts once more my heart beats still again krishna yeah it was wonderful and terrible to view me as thou didst dear prince the god's dread and desire continually to view yet not by vedas nor from sacrifice nor penance nor gift giving nor with prayer shall any so behold as thou hast seen only by fullest service perfect faith and uttermost surrender am i known and seen and entered into indian prince who doeth all for me 
who findeth me in all, adoreth always, loveth all which I have made, and me for love's sole end, that man Arjuna unto me doth wend. End of chapter 11 of the Bhagavad Gita Entitled Vishwarupa Darshanam or The Book of the Manifesting of the One and Manifold Translated by Sir Edwin Arnold Chapter 12 of the Bhagavad Gita Translated by Sir Edwin Arnold. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nicholas James Bridgewater. The Bhagavad Gita, translated by Sir Edwin Arnold. Chapter 12 Of the Religion of Faith. Arjuna. Lord, of the men who serve thee, true in heart, as God revealed, and of the men who serve, worshipping thee unrevealed, unbodied, far, which take the better way of faith and life. Krishna, whoever serve me, as I show myself, constantly true, in full devotion fixed, these hold I very holy, but who serve, Worshipping me, the one, the invisible, the unrevealed, unnamed, unthinkable, uttermost, all-pervading, highest, sure, who thus adore me, mastering their sense of one set mind to all, glad in all good. These blessed souls come unto me, yet hard the travail is for whoso bend their minds to reach the unmanifest. That viewless path shall scarce be trod by man bearing his flesh. But whereso any doeth all his deeds, renouncing self in me, full of me, fixed to serve only the highest night and day, musing on me, him will I swiftly lift forth from life's ocean of distress and death. Whose soul clings fast to me, cling thou to me, clasp me with heart and mind, so shalt thou dwell surely with me on high. But if thy thought droops from such height, if thou beest weak to set body and soul upon me constantly, despair not, give me lower service, seek to read me, worshipping with steadfast will, and if thou canst not worship steadfastly, work for me, toil in works pleasing to me, for he that laboureth right for love of me, shall finally attain. But if in this thy faint heart fails, bring me thy failure, find refuge in me, let fruits of labour go, renouncing all for me, with lowliest heart, so shalt thou come. For though to know is more than diligence, yet worship better is than knowing, and renouncing better still, near to renunciation, very near, dwelleth eternal peace who hateth not of all which lives, living himself benign, compassionate, from arrogance exempt, exempt from love of self, unchangeable by good or ill, patient, contented, firm in faith, mastering himself, true to his word, seeking me, heart and soul, vowed unto me, that man I love, who troubleth not his kind, and is not troubled by them, clear of wrath, living too high for gladness, grief or fear, that man I love, who dwelling quiet-eyed, stainless, serene, well-balanced, unperplexed, working with me, yet from all works detached, that man I love, who, fixed in faith on me, dotes upon none, scorns none, rejoices not and grieves not, letting good and evil hap, light when it will, and when it will depart, that man I love, who unto friend and foe, keeping an equal heart with equal mind, bears shame and glory with an equal peace, takes heat and cold, pleasure and pain, abides quit of desires, 
Hears praise or calumny in passionless restraint, Unmoved by each, linked by no ties to earth, Steadfast in me, that man I love. But most of all I love those happy ones, To whom tis life to live in single fervid faith And love unseeing, eating the blessed amrit of my being. End of chapter 12 Recording by Nicholas James Bridgewater Recorded in Alexandria, Egypt, North Africa The Bhagavad Gita or Song Celestial Translated by Sir Edwin Arnold Chapter 13. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The present recording is by Raju. Ramina45 at Hotmail.com Chapter 13. Of Religion by Separation of Matter and Spirit Arjuna, now would I hear, O gracious Kesava, of life which seems, and soul beyond, which sees, and what it is we know, or seem to know. Krishna Ye son of Kunti, for this flesh ye see is Kshetra, is the field where life disports, and that which views and knows it is the soul, Kshetraknya. In all fields, though Indian prince, I am Kshetraknya, I am what surveys. Only that knowledge knows which knows the known by the knower. What it is, that field of life, what qualities it hath, and whence it is, and why it changeth, and the faculty that voteth it, the mightiness of this, and how it voteth, hear these things from me. The elements, the conscious life, the mind, the unseen vital force, the nine great gates of the body, or the five domains of sense. Desire, dislike, pleasure and pain, and thought deep woven, and persistency of being, these all are wrought on matter by the soul. Humbleness, truthfulness and homelessness, patience and honor, reverence for the wise, purity, constancy, control of self, contempt of sense delights, self-sacrifice, perception of the certitude of ill, in birth, death, a disease, suffering and sin, detachment, lightly holding unto home, children and wife, and all that bindeth men, an ever tranquil heart in fortune's good and fortune's evil, with a will set firm to worship me, me only, ceasing not, loving all solitudes and shunning noise of foolish crowds, endeavors resolute to reach perception of the utmost soul, and grace to understand what gain it were, so to attain. This is true wisdom friends, and what is otherwise is ignorance. Now will I speak of knowledge best to know, the truth which giveth man amrit to drink, the truth of him, the parabram, the all, the uncreated, not asat, not sat, not form, nor the unformed, yet both and more, whose hands are everywhere and everywhere, planted his feet and everywhere, his eyes beholding and his ears in every place, hearing, and all his faces everywhere, enlightening and encompassing his worlds, glorified by the senses he hath given. Yet beyond sense he is, sustaining all. He dwelleth unattached, of forms and modes, master, yet neither form nor mode hath he. He is within all beings, and without, motionless, yet still moving, not discerned, for subtlety of instant presence, close to all, to each, yet measurelessly far, not manifold, and yet subsisting still in all which lives, forever to be known as the sustainer, yet at the end of times he maketh all to end, and recreates. The light of lights he is, in the heart of the dark, shining eternally. Wisdom he is, and wisdom's way, and guide of all the wise, Planted in every heart, so have I told, of life's stuff, and the moulding, and the lore to comprehend. Whoso adoring me perceiveth this, shall surely come to me. 
Know thou that nature and the spirit both have no beginning. Know that qualities and changes of them are by nature wrought. The nature puts to work the acting frame, but spirit doth inform it and so cause feeling of pain and pleasure. Spirit linked to molded matter entereth into bond with qualities by nature framed, and thus married to matter, reached the birth again in good or evil yonis. Yet is this a in its bodily prison, spirit pure, spirit supreme, surveying, governing, guarding, possessing, lord and master, still Purusha, ultimate, one soul with me. Whoso thus knows himself and knows his soul, Purusha, working through the qualities with nature's moves, the light hath come for him. Whatever flesh he bears, never again shall he take on its load. Some few there be, by meditation find the soul in self, self-school, and some by long philosophy, and holy life reach thither. Some by words, some never so attaining, hear of light from other lips, and cease, and cleave to it, worshipping, yea, and those to teaching true overpass death. Wherever Indian prince, life is of moving things, or things unmoved, plant or still seed, Know what is there hath grown by bond of matter and spirit. Know he sees indeed who sees in all alike the living, lordly soul, the soul supreme, imperishable amid the perishing. For whoso thus beholds in every place, in every form, the same one living lord, doth no more wrongfulness unto himself, but goes the highest road which brings to bliss, seeing he sees indeed who sees that words or nature's own for soul to use not love acting yet not the actor sees the mass of separate living things each of its kind issue from one and blend again to one then hath he brahma he attains o prince that ultimate high spirit uncreate unqualified even when it entereth flesh taketh no stain of acts worketh in naught light to the ethereal air, pervading all which for sheer subtlety avoid a taint. The subtle soul sits everywhere unstained. A light to the light of all piercing sun, which is not changed by aught it shines upon. The soul's light shineth pure in every place, and they who by such eye of wisdom see how matter and what deals with it divide, and how the spirit and the flesh have strife these wise ones go the way which leads to life. Here endeth chapter 13 of the Bhagavad Gita, entitled Chetra Chetra Chana Vibhagriyok, or The Book of Religion by Separation of Matter and Spirit. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The present recording is by Raju. Romina 45 at hotmail.com The Bhagavad Gita or Song Celestial Translated by Sir Edwin Arnold Chapter 14 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org the present recording is by Raju, Ramina45 at hotmail.com. Chapter 14 of Religion by Separation from the Qualities Krishna, at Father will I open unto thee this wisdom of all wisdoms uttermost, the which possessing all my saints have passed to perfectness. On these high verities, the land rising into fellowship with me, they are not born again at birth, of Kalpas, nor at Pulayas, suffer change. This universe, the womb, is where I plant seed of all lives. Then, Prince of India, comes birth to all beings, who so, with his son, mothers each mortal form Brahma conceives, and I am he that fathers, sending seed. Satvan, Rajas, and Tamas, so are named the qualities of nature, Sutvasness, passion, and ignorance. These three bind down the changeless spirit in the changeful flesh. 
were of sweet soothfastness by purity, living unsullied and enlightened, binds the sinless soul to happiness and truth, and passion being kin to appetite, and breeding impulse and propensity, binds the embodied soul. O Kunti's son, by tie of words, but ignorance, the child of darkness, blinding mortal men, binds down their souls to stupor, sloth, and drowsiness. Ye, prince of India, soothfastness binds souls in pleasant wise to flesh, and passion binds by toilsome strain. But ignorance which blots the beams of wisdom binds the soul to sloth. Passion and ignorance, once overcome, leave soothfastness. O Bharata, where this with ignorance or absent passion rules, and ignorance in hearts, not good nor quick, when at all gateways of the body shines the lamp of knowledge, then may one see well soothfastness settled in that city reigns, where longing is, and ardor and unrest, impulse to strive and, and gain and avarice, those spring from passion, prince, and grain and where darkness and dullness, sloth and stupor are, its ignorance hath caused them. Guru chief, moreover, when a soul departeth, fixed in soothfastness, it goeth to the place, perfect and pure, of those that know all truth, if it departeth in set habitude of impulse, it shall go into the world of spirits tied to works, and if it dies in hardened ignorance, that blinded soul is born anew in some unlighted home. The fruit of soothfastness is true and sweet. The fruit of lust is pain and toil. The fruit of ignorance is deeper darkness. Yea, for light brings light and passion ache to have. Blindness, bewilderments and ignorance grow forth from ignorance. Those are the first rise ever higher. Those are the second more take a mid place. The darkened soul sink back to lower deeps, loaded with witlessness. When watching life, the living man perceives the only actors are the qualities, and knows what lives beyond the qualities. Then is he come nigh unto me. The soul, thus passing forth from the three qualities, whereof arise all bodies, overcomes birth, death, sorrow, and age, and drinketh deep the undying wine of Amrit. Arjuna, O my Lord, which be the signs to know him that hath gone past the three modes? How liveth he? What way leadeth him safe beyond the threefold modes? Krishna, he who with equanimity surveys lustre of goodness, strife of passion, sloth of ignorance, not angry if they are, not angry when they are not, he who sits a sojourner and stranger in their midst, unruffled, standing off, saying, serving, when troubles break. These are the qualities he unto whom, self-centered, grief and joy sound as one word, to whose deep-seeing eyes the clod, the marble, and the gold are one, whose equal heart holds the same gentleness for lovely and unlovely things, firm set, well-pleased in praise and dispraise, satisfied with honor or dishonor, unto friends and unto foes alike in tolerance, detached from undertakings, he is named surmounter of the qualities, and such with single fervent faith adoring me, passing beyond the qualities conforms to Brahma and attains me. For I am that whereof Brahma is the likeness. Mine the Amrit is, and immortality is mine, and mine perfect felicity. Here ends chapter 14 of the Bhagavad Gita entitled Unatraya Vibhaga Yoga or the Book of Religion by Separation from the Qualities. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The present recording is by Raju. Ramina45 at hotmail.com Chapter 15 of the Bhagavad Gita. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Shubda Garani. The Bhagavad Gita, 
Translated by Sir Edwin Arnold Chapter 15 Of Religion by Attaining the Supreme Krishna Men call the Ashwatha, the banyan tree, which hath its boughs beneath, its roots on high, the ever holy tree. Yea, for its leaves are green and waving hymns, which whisper truth, who knoweth well the Ashwatha knows all. Its branches shoot to heaven and sink to earth, even as the deeds of men which take their birth from qualities. Its silver sprays and blooms, and all the eager verdure of its girth, leap to quick life at touch of sun and air, as men's lives quicken to the tempting sphere of wooing sense. Its hanging rootlets seek the soil beneath, helping to hold it there. As actions wrought amid this world of men, bind them by ever-tightening bonds again. If ye knew well the teaching of the tree, what its shape saith, and whence it springs, and then how it must end, and all the ills of it, the axe of sharp detachment ye would wet, and cleave the clinging snaky roots, and lay this ashwatha of sense like low, to set new growths upspringing to that happier sky, which they who reach shall have no day to die, nor fade away nor fall, to him I mean, father and first, who made the mystery of old creation. For to him come they from passion and from dreams who break away, who part the bonds constraining them to flesh, and him the highest worshipping away. No longer grow at mercy of what breeze of summer pleasure stirs the sleeping trees, what blast of tempest tears them, bow and stem, to the eternal world pass such as these. Another sun gleams there, another moon, another light, a light which none shall lack, whose eyes once see, for those return no more, they have attained my uttermost abode. When in this world of manifested life, the undying spirit, setting forth from me, taketh on form, it draweth to itself from being's storehouse, which containeth all, senses and intellect, the sovereign soul, thus entering the flesh, or quitting it, gathers these up, as the wind gathers scents blowing above the flower banks, ear and eye and touch and taste and smelling, these it takes, yeah, and a sentient mind, linking itself to sense thinks so. The unenlightened ones mark not that spirit when he goes or comes, nor when he takes his pleasure in the form, conjoined with qualities. But those see plain, who have the eyes to see, holy souls see, which strive thereto, Enlightened, they behold that spirit in themselves. But foolish ones, even though they strive, discern not, having hearts unkindled, ill-informed. No too from me shineth the gathered glory of the sun, which lightens all the world. From me the moon draws silvery beams, and fire fierce loveliness. I penetrate the clay and lend all shapes their living force. I glide into the plant, its root, leaf, bloom, to make the woodland green with springing sap. Becoming vital warm, I glow in glad, respiring frames, and pass with outward and with inward breath to feed the body with all meats. For in this world, being is twofold, the divided one, the undivided one. All things that live are the divided, that which sits apart, the undivided. Higher still is one, the highest, 
holding all whose name is Lord, the eternal, sovereign first, who fills all worlds, sustaining them, and dwelling thus beyond divided life and undivided. I am called of men and Vedas, God supreme, the Purushottama, who knows me thus with mind unclouded, knoweth all, dear Prince, and with his whole soul ever worshipeth me. Now is the sacred secret mystery declared to thee. Who comprehendeth this hath wisdom. He is quit of works in bliss. Here ends chapter 15 of the Bhagavad Gita entitled Purushottama Prapti Yoga or The Book of Religion by attaining the Supreme. Supreme. The Bhagavad Gita or Song Celestial translated by Sir Edwin Arnold. Chapter 16 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Present recording is by Raju. Ramina45 at hotmail.com Chapter 16 Of the Separateness of the Divine and the Undivine Krishna Fearlessness, Singleness of Soul, The Will Always to Strive for Wisdom, Open Hand and Governed Appetites, and Piety, and Love of Lonely Study, Humbleness, Uprightness, Heed to Injure Not Which Lives, Truthfulness, Slowness unto Wrath, a mind that lightly letteth go what others prize, and equanimity and charity, which inspireth no man's faults, and tenderness towards all that suffer, a contented heart, fluttered by no desires, a bearing mind modest and grave, with manhood nobly mixed, with patience, fortitude, and purity, an unrevengeful spirit never given to rate itself too high, such be the signs, O Indian Prince, of him whose feet are set on that far path which leads to heavenly birth. Deceitfulness and arrogance and pride, quickness to anger, harsh and evil speech, and ignorance to its own darkness, these be the signs, my Prince, of whom whose birth is fated for the regions of the wild. The heavenly birth brings to deliverance, so shouldst thou know. The birth with Asuras brings into bondage. Be thou joyous, Prince, whose lot is set apart for heavenly birth. Two stamps there are marked on all living men, divine and undivine. I spake to thee, by what marks thou shouldst know the heavenly man. Hear from me now of the unheavenly. They comprehend not the unheavenly. Households go forth from me nor how they come back unto me, nor is there truth in these, nor purity, nor rule of life. This world hath not a law, nor order, nor a lord, so say they, nor hath risen up by cause, following on cause, in perfect purposing, but is none other than a house of lust, and this thing thinking, all those vain ones, of little wit, dark-minded, give themselves to evil deeds, the curses of their kind, surrendered to desires insatiable, full of deceitfulness, folly and pride, in blindness cleaving to their errors, caught into the sinful course, they trust this lie, as it were true, this lie which leads to death, finding in pleasure all the good which is, and crying, here it finisheth. Ensnared in nooses of a hundred idle hopes, slaves to their passion and their wrath, they buy wealth with base deeds to glut hot appetites. Thus much today, they say, we gained thereby. Such and such wish of heart shall have its fill. And this is ours, and the other shall be ours. Today we slew a foe, and we will slay our other enemy tomorrow. Look, are we not lords? Make we not goodly cheer. Is not our fortune famous, brave and great? Rich are we, proud born. What other men live like to us? 
kill then for sacrifice, cast largies and be merry. So they speak, darkened by ignorance, and so they fall, tossed to and fro with projects, tricked and bound in net of black delusion, lost in lust, down to foul naraka, conceited, fond, stubborn and proud, dead drunken with the wine of wealth and reckless, all their offerings have but a show of reverence, being not made in piety of ancient faith. Thus vowed to selfhood, force, insolence, feasting, wrath, these my blasphemers, in the forms they wear, and in the forms they breathe, my foemen are, hateful and hating, cruel, evil, vile, the least of whom I cast down, again and yet again, at end of lives, into some devilish womb, whence birth by birth the devilish wombs respawn them, all beguile, and till they find and worship me, my sweet prince, tread they not nether road. The doors of hell are threefold, whereby men to ruin pass, the door of lust, the door of wrath, the door of avarice. Let a man shun these three. He who shall turn aside from entering all those three gates of Narak, wendeth straight to find his peace, and comes to Sargas gate. Here endeth chapter 16 of the Bhagavad Gita, entitled Deva Sarasopat Vibhaga Yoga, or The Book of the Separateness of the Divine and Undivine. End of chapter 16 of the Bhagavad Gita. The present recording is by Raju Ramina45 at hotmail.com. The Bhagavad Gita or Song Celestial, translated by Sir Edwin Arnold, chapter 17. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The present recording is by Raju. Ramina45 at Hotmail.com Chapter 17 Of Religion by the Threefold Kinds of Faith Arjuna If men forsake the holy ordinance, heedless of Shastras, yet keep faith at heart and worship, what shall be the state of those, great Krishna, Satvan, Rajas, Tamas, say, Krishna, threefold the faith is of mankind and springs from those three qualities becoming true or passion stained or dark as thou shalt hear. The faith of each believer, Indian prince, conforms itself to what he truly is. Where thou shalt see a worshipper, that one to what he worships lives assimilate. Such as the shrine, so is the votary. The Sutfas souls adore true gods. The souls obeying Rajas worship Rakshasas or Yakshas. And the men of darkness pray to Pretas and to Bhutas. A. And those who practice bitter penance, not enjoined by rightful root, penance which hath its root in self sufficient, proud hypocrisies, those men passion beset violent, wild, torturing, the witless ones, my elements shut in fair company within their flesh, nay, me myself, present within the flesh. Know them to devils devoted, not to heaven. For like, as foods are threefold for mankind in nourishing, so is their threefold way of worship, abstinence and almsgiving. Hear this of me. There is a food which brings force, substance, strength, and health, and joy to live. Being well seasoned, cordial, comforting, the soothfast meat. And there be foods which bring aches and unrest, and burning blood and grief, being too biting, heating, salt, and sharp. And therefore craved by too strong appetite, and there is foul food, kept from overnight, savorless, freely, which the fowl will eat, a feast of rottenness, meat for the lips, of such as love the darkness. Thus with rites, a sacrifice not for rewardment made, offered in rightful wise, when he who vows, saith with heart devout, this I should do, is soothfast right, 
but sacrifice for gain, offered for good repute. Be sure that this, O oh best of Bharatas, is Rajas right, with stamp of passion, and a sacrifice offered against the loss, with no due dole of food giving, with no accompaniment of hallowed hymn, nor largis to the priest, in faithless celebration, call it white, the deed of darkness lost. Worship of gods meriting worship, lowly reverence of twice bonds, teachers, purity, rectitude, and the brahmacharya's form, and not to injure any helpless thing, these make a true religiousness of act. Words causing no man woe, words ever true, gentle and pleasing words, and those ye say, in murmured reading of a sacred writ, these make the true religiousness of speech. Serenity of soul, benignity, sway of the silent spirit, constant stress to sanctify the nature, these things make good right and true religiousness of mind. Such threefold faith in highest piety, kept with no hope of gain by heart's devote, is perfect work of Satvan, true belief. Religion shown in act of proud display to win good entertainment, worship, faith, such, say I, is of Rajas, rash and vain. Religion followed by a witless will to torture self or come at power to hurt another, such of commerce, dark and ill. The gift lovingly given when one shall say, Now must I gladly give, when he who takes can render nothing back made in due place, due time, and to a meet recipient, is gift of Satvan, fair and profitable. The gift, selfishly given, where to receive is hope again, or when some end is sought, or where the gift is proffered with a grudge, this is of Rajas, stained with impulse, ill. The gift, churlishly flung, at evil time, in wrongful place, to base recipient, made in disdain or harsh unkindliness, is gift of Thomas, dark, it doth not bless. Here ended chapter 17 of the Bhagavad Gita entitled Sraddha Traya Vibhaga Yog or The Book of Religion by the Threefold Kinds of Faith. End of chapter 17 of the Bhagavad Gita. Present recording is by Raju Ramina45 at hotmail.com Chapter 18 of the Bhagavad Gita. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Leon Meyer. The Bhagavad Gita. Translated by Sir Edwin Arnold. Chapter 18. Arjuna. Fain would I better know, thou glorious one, the very truth heart's lord of sannyas, abstention and renunciation, lord, tia, and what separates these twain? Krishna. The poets rightly teach that sannyas is the foregoing of all acts which spring out of desire, and their wisest say tiaga is renouncing fruit of acts. There be among the saints some who have held all action sinful, and to be renounced, and some who answer, Nay, the goodly acts, as worship, penance, alms, must be performed. Hear now my sentence, best of Bharatas. Tis well set forth, O chaser of thy foes. Renunciation is of threefold form, and worship, penance, alms, not to be stayed, nay, to be gladly done for all those three are purifying waters for true souls. Yet must be practiced even those high works in yielding up attachment, and all fruit produced by works. This is my judgment, Prince, this my insuperable and fixed decree. Abstaining from a work by right prescribed never is meet. So to abstain doth spring from darkness, and delusion teacheth it. Abstaining from a work grievous to flesh, when one saith, "'Tis unpleasing, this is null." Such an one acts from passion, not of gain, wins his renunciation. But, Arjun, abstaining from attachment to the work, abstaining from rewardment in the work, 
while yet one doeth it full faithfully, saying, "'Tis right to do," that is true act in abstinence. Who doeth duty so, unvexed if his work fail, if it succeed unflattered, in his own heart justified, quit of debates and doubts, his is true act. For, being in the body, none may stand wholly aloof from act. Yet, who abstains from profit of his acts is abstinent. The fruit of labors in the lives to come is threefold for all men, desirable and undesirable and mixed of both. But no fruit is at all where no work was. Hear from me, long-armed Lord, the makings five which go to every act, in Sankhya taught as necessary. First, the force, and then the agent, next, the various instruments, fourth, the especial effort, fifth, the god. What work soever any mortal doth, of body, mind, or speech, evil or good, by these five doth he that. Which being thus, whoso for lack of knowledge seeth himself as the sole actor, knoweth not at all, and seeth not. Therefore, I say, if one, holding aloof from self, with unstained mind, should slay all yonder host, being bid to slay, he doth not slay, he is not bound thereby. Knowledge, the thing known, and the mind which knows, these make the threefold starting ground of act, the act, the actor, and the instrument. These make the threefold total of the deed. But knowledge, agent, act are differenced by three dividing qualities. Hear now which be the qualities dividing them. There is true knowledge. Learn thou it is this, to see one changeless life in all the lives, and in the separate, one inseparable. There is imperfect knowledge, that which sees the separate existences apart, and, being separated, holds them real. There is false knowledge, that which blindly clings to one as if twere all, seeking no cause, deprived of light, narrow and dull and dark. There is right action, that which, being enjoined, is wrought without attachment, passionlessly, for duty, not for love, nor hate, nor gain. There is vain action, that which men pursue, aching to satisfy desires, impelled by sense of self, with all-absorbing stress. This is of rajas, passionate and vain. There is dark action, when one doth a thing heedless of issues, heedless of the hurt or wrong for others, heedless if he harm his own soul. Tis of tamas, black and bad. There is the rightful doer, he who acts free from self-seeking, humble, resolute, steadfast, in good or evil hap the same, content to do aright, he truly acts. There is the impassioned doer, he that works from impulse, seeking profit, rude and bold to overcome, unchastened, slave by turns of sorrow and of joy. Of rajas he, and there be evildoers, loose of heart, low-minded, stubborn, fraudulent, remiss, dull, slow, despondent, children of the dark. Here, too, of intellect and steadfastness, the threefold separation, conqueror, prince, how these are set apart by qualities. Good is the intellect which comprehends the coming forth and going back of life what must be done and what must not be done, what should be feared and what should not be feared, what binds and what emancipates the soul. That is of Satwan, Prince, of soothe fastness. Marred is the intellect which, knowing right and knowing wrong, and what is well to do, and what must not be done, yet understands not with firm mind, nor as the calm truth is. This is of Rajah's prince, and passionate. Evil is intellect, which, wrapped in gloom, 
looks upon wrong as right, and sees all things contrariwise of truth. O Prita's son, that is of Tamas, dark and desperate. Good is the steadfastness whereby a man masters his beats of heart, his very breath of life, the action of his senses, fixed in never shaken faith and piety. That is of Satwan, prince, sooth fast and fair. Stained is the steadfastness whereby a man holds to his duty, purpose, effort, end, for life's sake, and the love of goods to gain Arjuna. Tis of Rajas, passion stamped. Sad is the steadfastness wherewith the fool cleaves to his sloth, his sorrow and his fears, his folly and despair. This, Prita's son, is born of Tamas, dark and miserable. Hear further, chief of Bharatas, from me the threefold kinds of pleasure which there be. Good pleasure is the pleasure that endures, banishing pain for I, bitter at first as poison to the soul, but afterward sweet as the taste of Amrit. Drink of that. It springeth in the spirit's deep content. And painful pleasure springeth from the bond between the senses and the sense world. Sweet as Amrit is its first taste, but its last, bitter as poison. Tis of Rajas, prince. And foul and dark the pleasure is which springs from sloth and sin and foolishness. At first and at the last, and all the way of life, the soul bewildering. Tis of Tamas, prince. For nothing lives on earth, nor midst the gods in utmost heaven, but hath its being bound with these three qualities, by nature framed. The work of Brahmins, Kshatriyas, Vaishyas, and Sudras, O thou slayer of thy foes, is fixed by reason of the qualities planted in each. A Brahmin's virtues, prince, born of his nature, are serenity, self-mastery, religion, purity, patience, uprightness, learning, and to know the truth of things which be. A Kshatriya's pride, born of his nature, lives in valor, fire, constancy, skillfulness, spirit and fight, and open-handedness and noble mien, as of a lord of men. A Vaishya's task, born with his nature, is to till the ground, tend cattle, venture trade. A sudra state, suiting his nature, is to minister. Whoso performeth, diligent, content, the work allotted him, whate'er it be, lays hold of perfectness. Hear how a man findeth perfection, being so content. He findeth it through worship, wrought by work, of him that is the source of all which lives, of him by whom the universe was stretched. Better thine own work is, though done with fault, than doing others' work, even excellently. He shall not fall in sin, who fronts the task set him by nature's hand. Let no man leave his natural duty, prince, though it bear blame. For every work hath blame, as every flame is wrapped in smoke. Only that man attains perfect surcease of work, whose work was wrought with mind unfettered, soul wholly subdued, desires forever dead, results renounced. Learn from me, son of Kunti, also this, how one attaining perfect peace attains Brahm, the supreme, the highest height of all. Devoted, with a heart grown pure, restrained in lordly self-control, foregoing wiles of song and senses, freed from love and hate, dwelling mid solitudes, in diet, spare, with body, speech, and will, tamed to obey, ever to holy meditation vowed, from passions liberate, quit of the self, of arrogance, impatience, anger, pride, freed from surroundings, quiet, lacking naught, such an one grows
grows to oneness with the Brahm. Such an one, growing one with Brahm, serene, sorrows no more, desires no more. His soul, equally loving all that lives, loves well me, who have made them, and attains to me. By this same love and worship doth he know me as I am, how high and wonderful, and knowing straightway enters into me. And whatsoever deeds he doeth, fixed in me as in his refuge, he hath won for ever and for ever, by my grace, the eternal rest. So win thou, in thy thoughts do all thou dost for me, renounce for me, sacrifice heart and mind and will to me, live in the faith of me. In faith of me, all dangers thou shalt vanquish by my grace. But trusting to thyself and heeding not, thou canst but perish. If this day thou sayest, relying on thyself, I will not fight, vain will the purpose prove, thy qualities would spur thee to the war. What thou dost shun, misled by fair illusions, thou wouldst seek against thy will, when the task comes to thee, waking the promptings in thy nature set. There lives a master in the hearts of men, maketh their deeds by subtle pulling strings, dance to what tune he will. With all thy soul trust him, and take him for thy succor, prince. So, only so, Arjuna, shall thou gain, by grace of him, the uttermost repose, the eternal place. Thus hath been opened thee this truth of truths, this truth of truths, the mystery more hid than any secret mystery. Meditate, and, as thou wilt, then act. Nay, but once more, take my last word, my utmost meaning have. Precious thou art to me, right well beloved. Listen, I tell thee for thy comfort this. Give me thy heart, adore me, serve me, cling in faith and love and reverence to me. So shalt thou come to me. I promise true, for thou art sweet to me. Let go those rights and writ duties. Fly to me alone. Make me thy single refuge. I will free thy soul from all its sins. Be of good cheer. Hide, the holy Krishna saith, this from him that hath no faith. Him that worships not, nor seeks wisdom's teaching when she speaks. Hide it from all men who mock, but wherever mid the flock of my lovers one shall teach this divinest, wisest speech, teaching in the faith to bring truth to them, and offering of all honor unto me, unto Brahma cometh he. Nay, and nowhere shall ye find any man of all mankind doing dearer deed for me, nor shall any dearer be in my earth. Yea, furthermore, whoso reads this converse, or held by us upon the plain, pondering piously in vain, he hath paid me sacrifice. Krishna speaketh in this wise. Yea, and whoso, full of faith, heareth wisely what it saith, heareth meekly. When he dies, surely shall his spirit rise to those regions where the blessed, free of flesh, enjoins rest. Hath this been heard by thee, O Indian prince, with mind intent? Hath all the ignorance which bred thy trouble vanished, my Arjun? Arjuna. Trouble and ignorance are gone. The light hath come unto me by thy favor, Lord. Now am I fixed, my doubt is fled away. According to thy word, so will I do. Sanjaya. Thus gathered I the gracious speech of Krishna, O my king. Thus have I told, with heart a thrill, this wise and wondrous thing. 
By great Vyasa's learning wit, How Krishna's self made known, The Yoga, being Yoga's lord, So is the high truth shown. And I, when I remember, O Lord my King, Again Arjuna and the God in talk, And all this holy strain, Great is my gladness. When I muse that splendor, passing speech, Of Hari, visible and plain, there is no tongue to reach my marvel and my love and bliss. O oh, Archer Prince, all hail! O oh, Krishna, Lord of Yoga, surely there shall not fail blessing and victory and power for thy most mighty sake, where this song comes of Arjun, and how with God he spake. Here ends chapter 18 entitled Mokshasan Yasuyog, or The Book of Religion by Deliverance and Renunciation. End of chapter 18 End of the Bhagavad Gita Translated by Sir Edwin Arnold